Chapter Three of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, The Deluge. The children of Epimetheus and Pandora wandered in the gardens of the earth just as their parents had done, and the generations that followed them lived peacefully and were happy in spite of the brown-winged sprites that went about doing mischief. Men helped each other to cultivate the fruitful soil, and offered sacrifices to the gods, in return for a bountiful harvest. This golden age of the world's history might have lasted for ever if men had continued to reverence the gods. But after a time they ceased to offer prayers for health and safety, and boasted proudly of their own strength. They looked no more to high Olympus for help, but each man trusted to his own right arm. Then strife and discord arose, and fierce wars were fought among all the peoples of the earth. Brother killed brother, and fathers strove with their own sons. Every man's hand was against his fellow, and he knew no law but that of his own will. Seldom now were the fires kindled on the neglected altars, and the smell of burnt offerings dear to the gods no longer mingled with the smoke that rose up to the white clouds round Olympus. The sacred vessels mouldered in forsaken temples. Around the shrines of the gods the snakes crawled lazily, and the bat and owl dwelt undisturbed among the pillars of the temples. For a time the gods sat patient, believing that this state of things could not last. But seeing that mankind was growing worse instead of better, year by year, they determined to put an end to godlessness, and to destroy the whole race of man. Then Jupiter called a council of the gods to decide on the most effective way of wiping out every vestige of human life so completely that not one soul would be left to tell to its children the story of those evil days when men neglected to worship the immortal gods and allowed their temples to decay. The most terrible punishment to visit upon man would be to set the whole world on fire, to make of it one great sacrificial altar on which human victims and not the garlanded ox, would burn night and day, and from which the smoke would rise up into the heavens so thickly that it would shut out the sight of a blackened and smouldering earth. The one objection to carrying out this plan was the fear lest the flames would leap so high that they would reach even to lofty Olympus, and so endanger the sacred throne of Jupiter. Though the fire might not utterly destroy it, the gods could not bear to think of its burnished red-gold base, being touched by any flame from earth's unholy fires. The only other effective method of destruction was water, and this the gods decided to employ. So on a certain day, when men were everywhere feasting and singing songs, and boasting of their victories in battle, Jupiter rent the heavens with a mighty thunderbolt, whose crashing drowned all sounds of merriment, and made men turn pale with fear. The skies opened, and the rain poured down in torrents, the rivers became swollen and flooded their banks, the waves of the sea, rising higher and higher, swept in great fury over the land, washing everything before them like so much chaff. Aeolus, god of the storm, opened the cave where he kept the winds securely bound, and let them loose to work havoc on the earth. Soon all the lowland was covered with water, not a dry spot remained anywhere but on the hills and thither the terrified people rushed, in the vain hope that the flood would subside before the mountains were submerged. But the waves rose higher and higher, and the winds, rejoicing in their freedom, beat up the water until it almost touched the clouds. The frail boats, to which men had at first desperately clung, were shattered to pieces in the fury of the storm, and on the crest of the waves the bodies of the dead were tossed like playthings. Higher and higher rose the water, until at length the mountain tops were covered, and all dry land had disappeared. So were the gods avenged. There was one spot, however, that was not yet hidden under the waters, and this was the top of Mount Parnassus, the highest hill of Greece. To this place of refuge had fled Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha, two virtuous souls, who alone of all the people on the earth had lived uprightly and worshipped the gods. When Jupiter saw them standing on the top of Mount Parnassus, and weeping over the universal destruction, he remembered their piety, and decreed that their lives should be spared. So he gave commands that the rains and the floods and the winds should cease, and the dry land appear. 
Then Aeolus brought the winds back from their mad wanderings, and bound them again in the cave. Neptune blew upon his conch shell, and the angry waves returned again to the sea. Little by little the treetops showed above the water, and the green earth smiled again under the warm rays of the sun. But it was upon a desolate and unpeopled world that the eyes of Deucalion and Pyrrha rested, and in their utter loneliness they almost wished that they had perished with their friends. They went slowly down the mountainside, not knowing where to go, being led blindly by the will of the gods to the temple at Delphi, the only building that was not destroyed. To this sacred spot men had been wont to come in the old, God-fearing days, to consult the wishes of the gods and to learn their own destinies. Here was the divine oracle that not even the most daring mortal would refuse to obey. When Deucalion and Pyrrha found themselves at the temple of Delphi, they made haste to consult the oracle, for they wished to repeople the land before another morning sun could look down upon a lifeless earth. To their surprise the oracle returned them this answer. Depart from here with veiled heads, and throw your mother's bones behind you. This command seemed impossible to obey, for they could never hope to find any grave when all landmarks had been washed away, and, even could they do so, it was an unheard-of sacrilege to disturb the bones of the dead. Deucalion sought, therefore, to explain the strange words of the oracle in some other way, and at length he guessed the meaning of the god's answer. It was no human remains that he was commanded to desecrate. The bones referred to were those of Mother Earth. So husband and wife left the temple with veiled heads, and as they went they gathered up the stones at their feet, and threw these behind them. All the stones that fell from the hands of Deucalion turned into men, and those that Pyrrha dropped became women. Thus it was that, through the kindness and wisdom of the immortals, the earth was repeopled with a new race of men, that feared evil, and reverenced piety, and walked humbly before the gods. Never again was Jupiter forced to send a deluge on the earth, for men no longer let the altar-fires burn low, nor did they neglect to offer sacrifices because of forgotten prayers. End of chapter 3